Hello all and welcome to Crash Test Sim Racing's first video. I figured I would start the channel off in territory that's pretty familiar to me by now and that is getting the most out of the HPP JBV pedals in iRacing. We'll be looking at hardware adjustments and iRacing calibration both in the UI and through the config files. Although we will focus on the JBVs, there is a lot of common ground with other pedal sets when it comes to iRacing calibration, so there should be a good deal of info here for any iRacer. I should point out that I have an ongoing connection with HPP. Mark Hargett has been kind enough to include me in some design discussions and prototype testing over the years, and I've been using HPPs since the first set of PHTs launched back in 2013. Thanks to that connection, this video will also include a preview of a prototype brake accessory that will come to market later this year. Due to the amount of material I chose to cover here, this is not exactly a short video. So please feel free to use the index to skip around as needed, and I hope that that will serve as a useful quick reference moving forward. So we'll dive into some hardware tweaks first, and then we'll move on to the software calibration. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Add any questions you might have in the comments below, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Okay, let's start with a look at the throttle pedal and the adjustments that you can make on it. Uh, the first one is adjustment to the tension of the pedal. So uh, basically how firm it feels as you're using it. Uh, that's adjusted using this spring at the rear. The spring can be removed and replaced with one of the other options that come with the kit. Uh, for example, we've got a white, which is a little softer than what I have in here, and then the red, which is a good deal firmer down to your preference on how you like the pedal to feel. If you want to replace the spring, you just push in on this rear housing to release it from the pedal base, and then the spring comes out with it. Like I say, that's the blue. Uh, while we have this off, let's take a look at the throw adjustment mechanism. So by default, the pedal has pretty long throw. Um, works well for me, I like it just like that, but if you want a shorter throw, if we take a look in here, you can see we have a little hex nut retaining this uh, shaped piece of, I don't know, is it plastic, Delrin, whatever it is, it's very firm. Uh, you can replace this with another option uh, that comes with the pedals. So this one is uh, slightly longer, and this one here is longer again. The end result is, the shorter this piece, the more throw the pedal has. And the longer the piece, the less throw the pedal has. So, fairly easy adjustment to make. To get your spring back in, you simply put it back in the rear housing. You'll see there's a little retaining section there. Push it in, push the housing back into the rear, and there you go. Okay, so let's talk about how to tilt the throttle pedal, and this will also apply to the clutch pedal. Um, sometimes you may want to have a default position where the throttle is a little bit recessed versus the brake. If you're one of the unfortunately few left who are doing heel-toe braking, that can help. Um, so the easiest way to start is right in here. This clevis that mounts to the front pedal arm has an adjustable screw rod inside. So to get at that and to make an adjustment, the first thing we need to do is pop off this little clevis pin. So you just pull this out like so. And then holding the pedal arm, slide this pin out. So you just put that to one side for now. This frees the pedal arm uh, from this retaining bolt. Now at this point, what you need to do is loosen one or both of these nuts. There is some additional space in this housing for this threaded rod to screw in a little bit deeper and that would recess the pedal some. Also, there's space for it to come back out a little, pushing the pedal a little bit forward. You should view any adjustments in this area as 
micro adjustments. There are larger adjustments available through additional mount systems from HPP or potentially through your own mount. But for now, let's just take a look at how we would make an adjustment here. So using a half inch wrench, you can loosen this nut. Now I've already got it loosened. If it was pretty tight when it came to you, you could do something like brace it with a screwdriver in here and that will help you to loosen. So if I go ahead and loosen this, you can see I've got now quite a bit of space. I could screw this all the way off if I wanted to. Make sure you leave a decent amount of rod threaded inside this because you, you want to maintain some good structural integrity in your throttle. You can screw it down pretty darn far. You need to leave a decent amount of clearance in here. That's about as far as I would want you to go with the threaded rod. And then when you have it at the point you need it, just tighten this back up. Again, you could use a little screwdriver to brace against the wrench and that will tighten it up. Make sure that this is set up reasonably straight when you're done tightening because you don't want to rotate this joint any more than is absolutely necessary. Ideally you want to have, if you look down in here, you want to have that as straight as possible and not jammed up to one side. So this is pretty straight and then you can just pull your throttle arm or clutch arm back in. Take this, your little pin, stick that back through the arm and pop that back on. Now this is a much more recessed, or at least somewhat more recessed, throttle pedal than it was stock. Uh, if you need to go beyond that level of adjustment, i.e. what's available through this threaded rod, there are some custom mounts available through HPP, which can help you get a much wider range of adjustment. So let's say, for example, you wanted to recess the whole unit a lot more than that, you could use these side threaded holes here and here against these mounts and you could get a much much higher tilt. I will go ahead and install those and give you a bit of a peek at what it looks like if you decide to take that approach. Okay so here's an example of how you would tilt the throttle pedal using the available HPP brackets. Uh, in this case, I decided to tilt it rearwards, in other words, tilt this entire unit up. So I put the curved units at the front, curved brackets at the front, and the standalone uh, straight, almost risers at the rear. Now this bottom hole at the rear corresponds exactly with the bottom hole at the front. So if you chose to use that, the pedal unit would be level, which would allow you a different mount option if you wanted to use these for mounting to a pedal tray, uh, something along those lines. But if you're not looking for tilt, it's probably easier to use the front hole and the rear hole. So this gives you an idea of what can be done with the brackets. Obviously you can tilt it significantly more, you can move it all the way up or move it just one up. This is two holes up. Uh, you can also choose, of course, to have a forward tilt. You could use the upper hole here and the lower hole in front for a small amount of forward tilt. Or you could swap these brackets around, put the curved brackets at the rear, the straight brackets at the front, and then you could lift the rear quite a lot, uh, get a fairly substantial forward tilt. Okay, I think that covers it for uh, throttle pedal. Uh, let's move on to the clutch. Okay, let's take a look at the clutch mechanism on the JBVs. The adjustments that we've already covered for throttle, like spring, throw, tilt, or tilt via the side mounts, um, they're all the same on this pedal. The, the thing to note when it comes to feel and calibration for the clutch is this mechanism here, and the same on the other side. It's basically a moving cam that when you depress the clutch, it generates that over the top feeling. So there's a, lot, a good deal of initial resistance and as you get over the top it releases. So the nice thing about this is you can easily calibrate in an engagement point that you can then also feel very thoroughly underfoot. Um, 
something that's interesting to play with on this, and I'm going to try it now, is adjusting to throw so that the amount of movement you have after that over the top point is varied. Right now what I've got in here for the throw adjustment is the smallest uh, smallest plate or smallest back plate for throw which gives maximum throw to the clutch. I think a lot of people tend to short calibrate clutch to make it a little faster in use. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and pop out the spring like we did in the um, throttle adjustment. Uh, this is one of those red springs, very firm, appropriate for a clutch, but you can swap it out to uh, a lighter feel if you so wish. Um, but there's still quite a lot of resistance even without the spring. So I'm going to go ahead and replace this mechanism to reduce the throw and uh, we'll come back and see how that looks. Okay, so I've replaced the stock, um, call them a throw endpoint here, with the medium sized one. There is still a longer one available which will abbreviate the throw of the clutch even farther. So I'm going to go ahead and put the spring back in and uh, we'll see how that feels. This is my first time doing this part too because I've always just stuck with the, the default clutch. Uh, it's always felt good to me. Okay, so spring is back in. Now let's see where the end point comes. Yeah, that's interesting. So the end point now, the end of travel, is just a little bit closer to the over the top sensation you get in the clutch. So if you're fully depressed, the moment you start to release, you can start to feel the build of pressure as it ramps back over the top. I'm going to go ahead and put in the uh, shortest throw uh, option right now and we'll see how that feels. Okay, here we are with the shortest throw configuration on the clutch pedal. So let's experiment and see how that feels. Yeah, so at this point that's kind of your release point, the over the top, and the end of throw is just beyond that. So. That's a nice array of options for playing with the feel. Um, it's hard to judge how it feels on a table with your hand. Uh, so I'm probably going to run this configuration uh, as a test and see how it feels underfoot. Okay, I think that covers it for clutch adjustments. We'll get into calibration obviously in a little while. But uh, let's now move on to the main event, the brake. Okay, let's take a look at the real heart of the JBV system and that is the hydraulic brake. I'm sure you're familiar with the basic layout but uh, this is master cylinder, slave cylinder and the shaft coming out of the slave cylinder holds bumpers. The full set of bumpers available from HPP uh, start at 40 durometer, go to 50, 60, 70 and 80 durometer. Uh, what all of that means is this is the softest, this is the firmest, and there are various combinations you can come up with that will determine how much pressure it takes to reach maximum travel on the pedals. Okay, so as a brief detour here, let's take a quick peek at uh, some test data I pulled together from testing all the various bumper combos available for the JBVs. This slide shows you a graph output of basically raw pedal output versus pedal travel given the bumper combos available to you. The red and black being you know, the, the firmest setup. So looking down the right hand side in that little chart, you'll see two columns, raw output and foot pressure. Uh, foot pressure is the amount of foot pressure required to reach that raw output for each given combo. What it also tells you is the foot pressure required to reach maximum travel in the master cylinder. You do not want to exceed maximum travel in the master cylinder because you're just pushing you know, the, the plunger against the wall of the master cylinder and you're not getting any more output. So uh, there's really no point to that. You'll feel like you've hit a brick wall on the brake and uh, you're just not really taking advantage of everything the system has to offer if, if you take that route. 
So I would encourage you to look through this chart and um, pay attention to the raw output you're seeing from DI view or in the iRacing calibration screen for the given bumper combo you've chosen to use. So if for example you're using an orange and yellow bumper combo and you're seeing a calibration value of 2500 instead of 2300 you may be getting into the, the travel limit of the master cylinder so you may want to consider adding some preload which will stiffen it up and allow you a higher raw output value for uh, for that combo or maybe moving to a higher combo up the list uh, you know play around with some different combos and pay attention to the expected raw output for max travel based on this slide this slide is also available on the HPP website. It's one of the images under the pedal system. Um, so let's take a look at changing out the bumpers. It's very trivial. This nut on the front turns off. You've got a washer, bumper, washer, bumper, washer, and just replace whatever you want in there. I like the orange and black combo. It allows quite a lot of pressure. Um, it just works well for my braking style. Now there's a term called preload when it comes to this and every pedal system that has bumpers in use. And basically what that means is zero preload will be tightening this front nut just to the point where it's snug. So at this point there's no space available for the bumpers to move around. The more you tighten this preload nut, the firmer the initial pedal travel will feel. Uh, you want to make sure that you have at least snugged this pre-node nut up against it. If there's space, then you start to get kind of a dead zone at the beginning of travel, which is no good. Most hydraulic systems do have a dead zone naturally, but because of the way this is set up, it's closed loop, uh, there is no dead zone in the initial pedal travel. So right now with a little bit of preload applied, there is no dead zone at the beginning of that pedal travel. You're immediately getting into some pedal travel. Um, unless of course you want a dead zone, in which case let's take a sneak peek at a new system that's under development. Um, this is the first prototype. Basically what that will allow you to do is create an initial dead zone and I'll explain why that might be interesting. Usually when I'm testing this uh, dead zone system I do so with the red. It's a nice balance between the orange and black. So what is this? This is basically a spring mechanism that allows some initial pedal travel at a fairly low strength and then it will bottom out so you will reach a point where it just becomes solid so you have an initial spring based travel and then it becomes solid against the bumper the net effect and you'll see me dropping in some washers etc here uh, because like I said this is prototype we still have to refine the sizing uh, lengths. The net effect of having this in place is, if I can get it on, you can configure this so that there is a small amount of dead zone. And what I've been doing with that is, because there is no natural dead zone, as soon as you start to push into this spring-loaded dead zone area, the sensor is still being activated. The sensor inside in this system is still being pressurized, so you still get some readout in uh, the iRacing controller, or in the Bodner controller. So what I've been using it for is this initial pressure area here. Once I get my foot up against that bumper and it's a little difficult to see on camera but you'll see there's a little initial travel that point there I've been able to configure as my trail braking so 
it's a very repeatable trail breaking spot. You can adjust that through calibration. You can then, of course, go ahead and play with brake bias, etc., in the sim uh, to fine tune it all for you. But uh, initial tests on this were done in uh, Ferrari GT3 around Coda, especially through the S's there and a few of the uh, tighter corners. A little trail braking and repeatable trail braking is very, very valuable, and this really came through like a champ. So um, that's something to look out for in the future. It is prototype. Uh, this is the first prototype, um, but I have no doubt it will become available to you guys uh, at some point relatively soon. Okay, so let's move on to the calibration and uh, hopefully we can point out some tips and tricks that will help you on your way there. So let's get started with the basic calibration process through the iRacing UI. Click into the Options tab, and our first stop is this little checkbox in the bottom left corner labeled Use Custom Controls for this car. I highly recommend you select this as it allows you to customize your pedal calibration on a per car basis. If you're new to iRacing, you might wonder why that's important, but that will become clear as we move on through the rest of this video. With that taken care of, let's dive right into the calibration. Go ahead and click on the Pedals button in the Input Calibration section of this Options tab. This will guide you through the setup for each pedal, beginning with the throttle. As we move the throttle pedal through its full range of motion, iRacing is recording the low and high values that it receives from the pedal controller. This number on the left represents the lowest observed value, this number on the right is the highest observed value, and this number in the center here shows a live feed from the current position of the throttle pedal. That's about all there is to the throttle for now, so let's click done and move on to the brake. Now before we get into the brake calibration, it's important to understand our goals here. This can get a little detailed, but hang in there. When I calibrate my brake pedal, I'm focused on two key braking skills that I need to take advantage of in the sim. The first is trail braking, and the second is threshold braking. Trail braking is when you hold in a small amount of brake force to cause a forward weight shift in the car. This adds front end grip and helps you with corner entry. It's called trail braking as it usually occurs towards the end of a braking zone where you gradually trail off the brake pressure as you turn in towards the apex. It can be a difficult skill to master and requires a good feel for where your brake pedal is in its range of motion. This is where careful calibration can be a big advantage. Threshold braking is where you aim to provide as much brake input as possible without locking up the tires. For cars without an ABS system, this is especially critical, but even for cars with ABS, it can often be faster to threshold brake instead. So let's take a look at how the UI-based calibration works, and then we'll factor in our trail braking and threshold braking preferences. Let's add some input to the brake pedal, and we'll see what happens. The numbers you see here represent the same low end and high end points that we already calibrated for the throttle, but there's some different behavior that we need to factor in here for a hydraulic system like we find on the JBVs. When the brake system is pressurized, the bumpers on the slave cylinder shaft get compressed. When you release the pressure, those bumpers attempt to return to their original size. However, due to an effect called hysteresis, there is a lag before they will get back to that full original length. This doesn't really present a problem for the performance of the brake, as the bumpers will almost get back to their full size very quickly after you release. What we need to look out for during calibration is to make sure we don't calibrate in an endpoint that relies on fully uncompressed bumpers that have been allowed to sit for a while. Otherwise, we may see some lingering brake input each time we release the brake pedal. We can easily decide on a minimum target for that low-end calibration by pressing the brake a few times and observing where it tends to settle. In this case, somewhere around 540 to 550 looks like a good target. Before you settle on that number, there's one other thing you should consider. If, like me, you like to rest your foot on the brake while not actually using it, that will impact the value that's being fed from the controller to the sim. So if I go ahead and do that now, resting my brake foot on the pedal, I see a much higher number than the 550 we settled on a moment ago. So in my case, somewhere around 
670, 680. Maybe we'll call it 700 just to be safe, to make sure that I don't accidentally have any low end input after I release the pedal. So the other number we need to have in mind before we complete our calibration pass is the value that the controller will output for our preferred threshold brake pressure. Now braking is so much about feel, and my preference is to use the highest brake pressure I can reliably, repeatedly deliver to the sim without any great discomfort for the length of an entire race. Repeatability is key here, so try some repetitive brake inputs to simulate the feel you are looking for for your threshold brake pressure. In my case, somewhere around 2200 is likely what I want to reproduce. That seems to be the number I'm getting to fairly routinely when I hit the brake at what I would want my max pressure to be. So now we have a good low end point target of 700 for me and a good threshold target of 2200, but we need to calculate the high end. We can't simply calibrate the pedals from our low end to our threshold brake point, as that would correspond to 0% to 100% braking in the sim. So if we did that and we hit our threshold brake feel, we'd get 100% brake. And most cars in iRacing will lock up their tires long before we reach that 100% value. The brake percentage that will cause a car's tires to lock up will vary from car to car and maybe even from setup to setup, but you can usually figure this out pretty quickly in a test session. Run a few laps to get your tires warmed up and then start paying close attention to the brake percentage used in your heaviest brake zones. What you're looking for is that magic number right before you lock up the brakes. There are quite a few telemetry display options out there that can help you with this. I use RaceLab right now, for example. Once you've figured out an approximate percentage that will lock up the tires, you can use that during calibration. Right now, we're in the Ferrari 488 GT3. And for the sake of this video, I'm going to say that car locks up at about 70%. That's probably not very accurate, but it's close enough for now. So now we have all the numbers we need to get the brake calibration dialed in. We know that the low point of our calibration will be at 700 to allow for that foot rest that I do. We also know that my target threshold brake will be at 2200. Now that range from 700 to 2200 needs to correspond to 70% of the total range from the low end to the high end that we calibrate so that when I input that threshold value, I get 70% from the sim. So if we subtract the low end of 700 from our target threshold pressure of 2200, we get 1500. Now we know that corresponds to 70% of the total range, so we can easily calculate what the total range of the calibration should be. If I pull in a calculator here, take my 1500, that represents 70% of the full range, so to convert that to 100%, we just divide by 0.7. So that's telling me that the full range of calibration of this brake from low end to high end should be 2142. If we add that to our low point, we'll get our high point. So let's do that. So that's telling me that the high end of this calibration should land at 2842. So let's go ahead and put that in through the UI. Now, right now, the UI has registered a very low value of 451 as the low end, and we don't have a correct high end. So we need to reset these values. We can do that with the reset button here. But if we just go ahead and hit reset and start pushing on the brake pedal, again, we've got a low value here. That's no good. We need to tell the sim to use no lower than 700. To do that in the interface, you hold in the pressure that you want as the low end, I'm going to make it as close as I can to 700. That's one of the disadvantages of using the UI, is you can't be as accurate as you can with the config files, but we'll get to that. Holding in a value just over 700, I hit reset, and then I start adding more pressure to the brake. Here we can see the sim has registered 706 as the low end, and now I need to get to 2842 as my high end. So I'll keep adding pressure. Now this is significantly more pressure than I ever want to use in game, but remember that is because I want my ideal max pressure to give me 70%, not 100%. 
So that's not bad. We've got 706 to 2862. That's close enough, certainly for now. As I release the pedal, I'm careful not to let this value drop below the low end as it will end up moving the low end in the calibration. And for now, we can hit done and we'll move on to the clutch. We will come back and fine tune this later in the config files. So there are a few different schools of thought when it comes to calibrating a clutch. Some will calibrate it just like a throttle with a full travel of the clutch representing 0 to 100% in the sim. Others may choose to short calibrate the clutch or set it up so that it reaches 100% in the sim very early in the pedal's travel. This allows some very abrupt gear changes by requiring very little pedal movement to fully engage the clutch. Both of those approaches are easily accomplished in the UI, so there's no need to go through that here. The JVV clutch brings another option to the table. Because of the over-the-top sensation you get as the clutch mechanism cams are activated, you can feel a pronounced engagement point in the pedal's travel. You can choose to calibrate eye racing so that buildup of pressure you feel on the release stroke of the clutch can correspond to the bite point of the current car you're setting up in the sim. This approach is almost identical to calibrating the threshold brake. This time around, we need to figure out what clutch percentage will begin to launch the car in the sim. This is pretty easy to deduce from a test session. Start with a basic full travel clutch calibration, and from a standing start, slowly release the clutch until the car starts to move. Note the percentage of clutch travel required to make that happen. Using the same math as we did for setting the high end of the brake, we can now calculate the high end of the clutch calibration. Right now, we're in the Ferrari 488, so this type of clutch calibration doesn't really apply to this car because of the sequential gearbox, and it tends to be in standing start series. A car that I drive a lot that is heavily dependent on standing start is the Skip Barber. I know from testing in the Skippy that about 85% clutch will begin to launch the car. So we'll use that in our calibration demo today. So there's one last thing to figure out, and that is at what point in our clutch pedal travel do we want to calibrate in that bite point of 85%? If we go ahead and start moving the clutch through its range of motion, we'll get a low value, 170, and a high value, 3230. Now, as I push all the way in and start to slowly release, I can feel that buildup of pressure that we talked about, that over-the-top sensation. You feel that on the release stroke in addition to on the way into it. So I'm looking for a sensation that I feel I can repeat on the grid without risking engaging the clutch accidentally. So right about here is the point that I'm feeling I can repeatedly find while on the grid and about to launch. So let's call that maybe 2900 just to be safe. We don't want to accidentally jump the start. So now we have all the numbers we need to calculate our high end point and move forward with the calibration. We pull in our trusty calculator again. We have our target byte point controller value of 2900. Let's subtract the low end of 170. This is now the range from the low end to the byte point in the controller that I want to correspond to 85% from the sim. So if that's 85% of the total range, we convert that to 100% by dividing by 0.85, and we get a number 3211. This number corresponds to the entire range from the low end to the high end of the clutch calibration that we need to input. So if we add our low value to this, plus 170, we get our high end point that we need to use in the calibration. So we're gonna have a low end of 170, and a high end of 3381. When we do this, we will get 85% clutch from that target value of 2900 we figured out a little while ago. So let's go ahead and push the pedal all the way in. Ah, and here is why learning how to manipulate the config files is of great value. With my current hardware setup on the clutch pedal, I have reduced the throw so that there's not much throw or much travel beyond that over-the-top clutch mechanism. 
the end result of that is my controller is only going as far as 3240, whereas I need 3381. Now, there's two different approaches to solving this. Um, you can go back and modify the hardware so that you have a longer throw on the clutch pedal. That's an option. That will allow us to access those higher values that we need. Or you can learn to manipulate the configuration files and get it exactly the way you want, keeping the hardware as it is. So since it's important to understand those config files anyway, we'll take that approach for this video. For now, we can go ahead and click Done, knowing that this is not going to be an ideal clutch setup for us. But we'll fix that as we move on to the calibration files. One important housekeeping task before we get into the calibration files is to exit the Options screen. This will prompt iRacing to write your changes to the JoyCalib file. That way we don't lose anything that we've done through our user interface calibration. Once we've done that, JoyCalib has been written, we can go ahead and open up the Options tab again. So let's take a look at this JoyCalib file I keep mentioning. Let's open an Explorer window in the Documents iRacing folder. This is the main iRacing directory that will hold all of your calibration and setup information. And you can see a JoyCalib file here in this top level. This is a generic instance that's used when you do not check use custom controls for this car. Since we are doing that, we need to go into the setups directory and find the car that we're currently tuning, which right now is the Ferrari 488 GT3. Let's drop in there and we find our JoyCalib file here. So let's go ahead and edit this and we'll see what's inside. Okay, the file format is pretty straightforward. You'll see a device list. In this instance, we have two devices, the HPP interface for my pedals and Simicube 2 Pro for my steering wheel. There are three axes listed, one each for throttle, brake, and clutch. Each axis or pedal will have three calibration values, Calib Min, Calib Center, and Calib Max. Now these labels likely do not represent what you think they do. This trio of Calib Min, Calib Center, and Calib Max are there to facilitate calibrating combined pedals in addition to the much more common single axis per pedal. The sim will take Calib Center as the start point for your pedal travel and either Calib Min or Calib Max depending on which range is greater. In the case of the JBVs we will see our calibration from Calib Center to Calib Max. You will likely be able to identify which axis corresponds to throttle, brake, and clutch by thinking back to the numbers you calibrated in during the UI calibration. But you can also use an app called DIView to verify this. DIView is also a very useful way to view the raw controller values output from your pedal controller, and this can help you decide which values you want to plug into your modified calibration file. So let's take a quick peek at DIView before we start modifying Joy Calib. There's a link in the description below if you don't already have this on your system. Now the first time you launch DIView, it will likely have a lot more going on than what we see on this screen. I have eliminated everything except for the three HPP pedal axes. You can remove items you're not interested in simply Xing out of them in DIView. If you accidentally X out of something you do want to see, you can go into Edit and Re-Enumerate, and it will repopulate with everything it sees from controllers on your system. So here we have a nice clean display of the three axes on the HPP pedals. As we move through the pedals, we can identify which is which. X-axis is throttle, Z-axis is brake, and Y is clutch. Now, as a quick side note, it's important to understand that nothing we do in DI view will directly impact iRacing's calibration. iRacing pays no attention to the direct input values that can be manipulated by DI view. Instead, it relies on the raw controller output from, in this case, the Bodner controller in the HPP pedals. As we move through a range of motion, for example, on the throttle, we're seeing output from 0 to 65, 535. Those are direct input API values and not used by iRacing. To see the values that iRacing observes, we need to right click on each axis and select View Raw Data. Now you'll begin to see numbers that look a lot more familiar from our UI calibration passes. 
So in the case of throttle, we're going up as far as approximately 4083 and down as low as 190, perhaps even a little lower. So now that we know where to make changes and how to examine raw output from the controller, let's talk about the circumstances that might bring us here in the first place. Let's get back into the Options tab and see how our pedals are behaving from our previous UI calibration. Now if we look closely at the input to the sim as we go through our throttle's full range of motion, we might notice something a little bit odd at the low end. When I release the pedal, it doesn't completely reset to zero immediately. This is just a minor quirk in the mechanical behavior of the JBV throttle pedal. You may likely see it in other pedals too. Now, unless this lingering input at the low end sticks around for a good deal longer than we're seeing here, it's not going to have any effect on your racing. But this does provide a nice opportunity for us to manipulate JoyCalib and see how that works. So let's get back to JoyCalib and DI View and figure out how to deal with this. So while moving the throttle and looking at DI View, we know that it's associated with the X axis in the pedal controller. If we come down to the JoyCalib file, we can see the calibrated values for that x-axis. Now remember, the range we're looking for is Calib Center to Calib Max, not Calib Min. So we currently have a low point defined as 186 from our UI calibration. So let's have a close look at the raw output in DI view as we press and release the throttle pedal. You can see right now with it fully released, we are seeing 185, 184, which will work just fine with our currently calibrated low end of 186. But when we press and release, we see there's this momentary hesitation a little over 200. I'm going to estimate that at about 215. So if we calibrate that 215 number into our JoyCalib file, we should no longer see any lingering input at the bottom of the throttle. Even though it wasn't really an issue performance-wise to begin with, this will demonstrate how we can make changes and move on from there. So let's come on into JoyCalib. Let's make this change to Calib Center. Let's bump that up to 215. And we will hit Save. Now we jump back into the Options screen and let's pay attention to how the throttle is behaving in here. Same problem. Now this is where those of you who've stuck around long enough might get your reward. The conventional wisdom here is that in order to make JoyCalib changes and have the sim accept them, you need to exit the sim, make the changes, save the file, and then reload the sim. That's actually not necessary. There is a way to trick iRacing into reloading the values of your now modified JoyCalib file. So, Let's pretend we're going back into another UI-based calibration. Click on Pedals. Don't make any changes. Don't touch your pedals. Back out of it. Exit the wizard. This causes iRacing to abandon any changes that you may have been attempting to do through the UI and reload the JoyCalib file. So now if we move the throttle, that behavior is gone. So we have just successfully tweaked JoyCalib while the sim is running and we can view the changes in real time. This is a big, big time saver versus exiting the sim and reloading. It also makes configuring your pedals through JoyCalib a much faster, more iterative, and as a result, more powerful experience because you can really start to fine tune your experience this way. So now let's take a look at what we can do with the brake. This brake calibration is probably already quite good because we paid close attention to what we were doing through the UI. Again, it is not necessary to go into the config files to get a good calibration. It just helps to fine tune things. As I push through, I can find my threshold brake point up there somewhere around the 70% mark. And as I rest my foot on the pedal while not intending to brake, I'm not getting any accidental input. I can add a little bit of extra pressure and then we start getting into the brake travel. So my next step on a brake calibration will be to start running some laps in the sim. I'll start by paying really close attention to my trail braking performance. Most trail braking involves gradual reduction of brake input as you turn in towards the apex. Towards the end of that trail braking phase, you might want to hold in a little bit of brake pressure just to get that forward weight shift, add a little bit of grip to the front end, 
and hit that apex. I've often found that under those circumstances, the amount of pressure I'm keeping on the pedal does not correspond to the percentage of brake that I'm actually trying to convey to the sim. One solution would of course be to learn a new feel for that final phase of trail braking, but I found it much, much easier to just recalibrate my brake so that the pressure I want to use for that small percentage corresponds to the percentage I'm trying to convey in the sim. This is actually quite easy to accomplish. I'd recommend that while you're running some test laps, use some piece of software to display your brake and throttle inputs on screen. A telemetry style output like that provided by RaceLab, for example, is very useful for this. Then as you come out of a corner where you've attempted to trail brake, quickly look at that telemetry style trace and see just how much brake you were holding at the last phase of that trail braking. If you were holding more than you intended, simply raise the low end of your brake calibration through the JoyCalib file. Next time through, you'll get a lower percentage brake input for the same amount of pressure. Likewise, if you're not getting enough input to the sim for the amount of pressure you want to use, or maybe the brake is releasing entirely, then you can lower the low end point of your brake calibration so that the pressure you want to use will register a higher input to the sim. So then make the necessary changes in JoyCalib, use our little UI trick to get iRacing to reload the file, and retest until you hit that sweet spot. Once I'm happy with the low end and my trail braking performance, I move on to threshold braking. Even if our initial UI calibration was spot on for the threshold braking, the fact that we may have moved the low end of our calibration will impact the high end as we've changed the range in which your target threshold brake pressure now sits in the calibration of the brake pedal. So as we did during the UI calibration, run a few laps, see if your threshold is working, and use some changes in JoyCalib to fine tune it until you're happy with the results. That may seem like an awful lot of work, but this type of systematic brake tuning has delivered a lot more control for me in the sim and lowered lap times, so hopefully it will do the same for you. So there's a good chance that you will not need to make any changes to your clutch calibration outside of what you did through the user interface. However, on our pass through, attempting to calibrate a clutch for the 85% bite point we see in the Skippy, we were unable to hit that high point that we needed to calibrate in the sim. Now this is happening because as we covered in the hardware section, it is possible to reduce the overall throw of the clutch pedal. When you do this, the over-the-top feel point occurs closer and closer to the end of travel. And in this case, that's happening at more than 85% through the available throw on my clutch pedal. That brings up some problems when we try to calibrate it through the UI. Let's look at DIView and JoyCalib again, see if we can make this a little bit clearer. So on my system, the clutch is represented by the y-axis from the pedal controller. As I move through, I can see I'm getting a maximum value of 3235-ish from my clutch. As I slowly release, I'm looking for that over-the-top ramp-up of pressure that I can reproduce with feel while sitting on the grid getting ready to launch. That's somewhere around the 2900 mark for me. I think we used the same number when we did our user interface calibration pass. Now, if we take a look in JoyCalib, the y-axis is calibrated from 176 to 3240. That's our low and our max. Let's crunch the numbers again and see where our high end needs to be so that that 2900 over the top output corresponds to 85% in the sim. So let's pull in a calculator. We need to subtract our low end of 176 from our target byte point controller output value of 2900. 2900 minus 176 gives us 2724. That number, like we discussed earlier, represents 85% of the total range from low point to high point in the calibration. So if that's 85%, we need to convert that to 100% by dividing by 0.85, 3204. Now we need to remember to re-add the low end calibration of 176 to that. Let's add 176, 3380. So this means we need to calibrate our clutch to a 3380 max so that our 2900 byte point output gives us 85% in the sim. So let's go ahead and make that change. We currently have 3240. It needs to be 3380. Let's hit save. 
Now let's go back and take a look at the options screen. Now, before I force the sim to reload, let's take a look at what we currently have. We can reach 100% because that's how we calibrated it through the UI. When I release the pedal to the point where I want to feel that bite point, we're seeing, well, a higher number than we should. That's probably at about 90%. So let's force iRacing to reload our Joy Calib changes. Again, we drop into a calibration, back out of it, and now this time, because we've pushed the high end higher than we can actually reproduce with our current hardware configuration, when we go all the way into the clutch, we won't get 100% anymore. So now we're at, I don't know, at a guess 95%. But when I start to release and find that bite point feel in the clutch, we are now getting the output that we need from the sim. Now it's really important once you've made changes to the clutch like this that you get in the car and test thoroughly. You need to make sure that you're able to change gear in all circumstances. Test the launch to make sure you're not going to start creeping off the line when you don't intend to. And go back, make changes to your Joy Calib as needed to reach that sweet spot where you're happy with your clutch performance. Well that wraps it up. That took a heck of a lot longer than I anticipated when I first decided to make this video. But I hope you found it useful and it gains you some time on track. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions, please add them to the comments below. I'll get back to you when I can. I hope to create lots more content moving forward, so stay tuned. If you're still awake and want to see me test the calibration in the Ferrari, stick around. Thanks again. Happy racing. Okay, we've had a lap or two to uh, warm up the tires and the little guy behind the wheel. And let's see if we can put in one decent lap and test that configuration. Pretty good on fresh oil there. And this is, is where I found a real benefit to the trail braking setup. I'm sure most of you guys or many of you guys will be a lot faster than this, but whatever your speed, I would recommend you get in the car and uh, test a little after you make the calibration change to the pedals. And, you know, be prepared to tweak the values if your threshold braking is a little off, move them around, same for trail braking. So far, I'm thinking this config is working pretty well for me. At least finding a few apexes here and there. Not terrible lap of Coda. Thanks for watching, guys.